Hi, thanks for joining us for today's message from Calvary and Lake Havasu. Continuing the message to a messed up church series, today we are learning to navigate towards our purpose. You'll want to grab your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 through 20. If you want to follow along with the life notes, you can find those on our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now here's Pastor Robert Smith. You can go ahead and have a seat, and as you get settled in, let me encourage you to open your Bibles or Bible apps to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love if you would uh, make use of the ones of the Bibles in the chair in front of you. Uh, It's on page 1,134. You will find 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And uh, I want to say thank you for braving the heat to get here. Uh, It is uh, certainly uh, well in the grips of summer here. And I was reflecting uh, this past week as uh, school supplies are starting to trickle into our house to get ready for that, that as a parent of school-aged children, I think one of the greatest ripoffs is that we know summer break is ending, but for those of us here in Havasu, summer heat is not going away anytime soon. There's this thing in my head that I'm like, okay, kids are going back to school soon, summer is ending, but also I've lived here long enough to know, no, it's still going to be hot for a long, long time. Uh, But with that, I do have one announcement I want to uh, tack on to what Pastor Sean shared, and that is uh, that our school, Calvary Christian Academy, we've got a preschool through eighth grade school uh, that is just an awesome private Christian uh, school. We uh, are gearing up for a great year. I say we, I don't do anything except drop my kid off and cheer them on as they do a great job, but uh, they're gearing up for a great school year, and uh, they asked me to share, uh, this is an unusual announcement, but they've got openings in every grade except seventh grade. They've made some changes and hired some staff and expanded in some areas, and they've got opportunity for your kids. So if you are interested in getting your kids plugged into Calvary Christian Academy, you can go to ccahavasu.com or call the office on Monday and get that process rolling. Uh, Because if you've thought there's no space, well, that is not a, a an inhibitor, and also they've got some really awesome opportunities uh, that may mean your child can go to school tuition free there if money has been the issue of getting them plugged in. You can ask them about that. They'll get you all those details uh, for that. But as I mentioned, uh, school supplies are trickling in and uh, at our house, and it got me thinking about uh, how we mix the old and new and how sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. And what I mean by that is if you think back to school age uh, and you were in this time of, okay, we're getting ready for the next grade, Maybe you're moving from fourth to fifth grade or something like that. You have this this little bit of review time, but by and large, you move on completely. You don't have your textbook from last year. You don't have your teacher from last year. A lot of times you don't even have the same supplies, the same backpack and clothes. You get everything new and there's this reset uh, because you don't mix the old and the new. It's not just with with education that that's the case. Most of us grew up in a time before rechargeable batteries. So we were told not to mix old and new AA batteries or even worse, the C or D batteries. And and it wasn't just a conspiracy from the battery companies to get you to buy more batteries. There's actually like a safety reason there that a a new battery mixed with an old can actually cause that old one to leak or explode. Like it's it's legitimate. I did the the research for you, so you didn't have to. and, and you may question that, but none of us would question that with like our groceries. None of us come home with a new gallon of milk and, and look at the old one that's been in the back of the fridge for maybe a little bit too long. Go, well, let's mix them together and make like two decent ones. We would never do that because we understand that oftentimes mixing the old with the new will just ruin the new. And I share this because there's a spiritual implication here too. Spiritually, we have to understand that oftentimes mixing the old ways of living with our new life in Christ just ruins the new. And Jesus spoke on this frequently. He would even use metaphors to help people understand this. He talked about putting new wine in old wineskins, and I don't know how that works because I've never made wine with wineskins or made wine in general for that matter. Um, But he talked about how you don't do that and how you don't put a a new piece of unshrunken fabric on an old garment to patch it because it will tear it and, and create problems. And he shared these to say that, hey, we don't mix the old way of living with the new life we have in Jesus. And as we continue to dive into 1 Corinthians and look at the issues that the Corinthian church was struggling with, we see that so often the issues tied to their desire to bring things from their past way of living and keep them with them as they have this new life of following Jesus. 
And today we're going to see that uh, pretty clearly in uh, chapter 6. We're going to look at the second half of chapter 6 and look at all the ways they were trying to to hold on to past cultural and lifestyle things while also seeking to pursue Jesus and why that was creating issues for them. So let's take a look at this um, passage and see what uh, we are looking at today. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 12, and it says this. It says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by everything, by anything rather. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord will also raise up by his power. And do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute comes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. So there's some interesting things going on there. You probably understand why there's the uh, PG-13 caveat uh, in looking at this. Because Paul is, is diving into some pretty uh, serious issues that are going on there. Some pretty uh, big picture issues. But really, I think these are important for us to look at and, and to process how we interact with these as well. Because he starts with this idea of how do we navigate the things from both our past life, but also from the life that's around us. And and I want to start there because I think that's really helpful for us to process as well. And and the first thing that I think Paul's showing us is that, that navigating culture requires intentionality and godly wisdom. Because he starts with this statement, all things are lawful for me. And if you notice, it's in quotations. It's like they're, they're maybe you know, idiom of Corinth or their statement slogan. Hopefully it's not their church mission statement. That would be even more problematic. But, but this is something that they're saying a lot. They're like, oh, all things are lawful for me, so I can do this. They're, they're firmly living in this, this reality. They understood they had freedom in Christ, which is true. If we have a life-changing relationship with Jesus, we have freedom from sin and bondage and slavery to our rebellion against God's And we also have freedom of how we navigate our life. And they were overusing that freedom to live in areas of sin and rebellion. And and even more than that, they're looking around them at some cultural realities of of the things that were common in their city, which we'll get back to in a minute, and going, well, hey, this is okay because everyone around us is doing this. I don't think this is just a struggle for this church on a different continent a couple centuries ago, but this is a struggle for us as well. How do we live as people in a culture that that we're interacting here, we're present here, but we're also living holy and set apart for the Lord. How do we navigate those two things? How do we have wisdom and intentionality that that we're not living in sin like they're being rebuked for, but we're also able to interact and be relatable to the people around us and and live in this moment? And I wanna camp out here for a little bit because I love what he starts with here and the the concepts that are contained. and several years ago, I heard a pastor kind of give a, a filter or a metric for how we can process through this. How do we take the, the cultural items that are around us, the decisions, the actions, the lifestyle items, and filter those through? Is that to be part of my life or not? Uh, and he gave a, a three-part filter that, that I think is helpful, and uh, I want to share it with you. And that is, as, as we look at these things, we basically put these different cultural items in one of three buckets. And the first bucket is that we receive it. We go, hey, there's no morality or sin issue there. There's no objection to that. We're just going to receive that into our life. Uh, some, some examples are some innovations that have happened. Air conditioning. None of us are like, hey, is air conditioning sinful? No, we praise the Lord for air conditioning. Um, and we are thankful. None of us are like, did the guy who invented air conditioning know Jesus? No, we're just praising God that he, uh, he made this happen uh, and allows us to be here and not be completely drenched in sweat. 
Similarly, for those of you that are of the jogging variety, none of you questions, hey, is that a, a Christian exercise option? Or do we need to find a Christian jogging program? No, we just say, hey, that's an exercise. If you're so inclined, maybe not this time of year or you might die, but if you're so inclined, go jog and exercise. And so where there's not this direct conflict, where it doesn't directly go against God's instruction, it doesn't appear to have a moral implication, we just receive that with thanksgiving. We say, thank you for the innovations of air conditioning and automobiles and these things that, that we get to enjoy. The second one is also pretty simple. The second bucket, it's either we receive it or we reject it. And we look at things and we see how they're explicitly against God's instruction for us. They go directly against God's word and we reject it. We look at things like illegal substance use. As we look at, at this passage, you look at sexual sin and, and depravity and pornography and, and prostitution. You look at other illicitly illegal activities and you go, hey, as a Christian, we should have no part in this whatsoever. This is something we have to completely separate ourselves from. We have to completely distance and say, no, we reject this from our life. And it's not just those, those big picture items. It's even the little things that maybe the world around us wants to say, hey, that's okay. Things like dishonesty and gossip, violence and anger. People around us may say, hey, it's okay in moderation or it's okay in this category. But God's word speaks against that. And so we have to be people who go, no, you may embrace it, but we cannot. And even more controversially, you look at what's happening right now on the topic of marriage and sexuality and gender, and you, and you realize that culture is affirming and embracing things that biblically we cannot. And we have to be people who say, hey, that might be the movement of our society, but that's not gonna be the movement of our beliefs and values as a follower of Christ. Now, that doesn't give us license, though, to go around with a spiritual sledgehammer beating people over the head with this truth, but it points us to the fact that we've got to live with truth in our life and also the truth of saying, hey, I'm called to love and serve my neighbors despite what their beliefs are and point them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus so that they can find the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their life. But but we have to look at these things and go, hey, if, if scripture speaks against them, we have to live that way. Even if we have a desire to, to embrace those things, even if the culture around us is saying yes to these things, we have to reject it. So the, the three buckets are to receive it, to reject it. The third is a little bit more complicated and that's to redeem it. Where we can look at something and go, well, if it's used in this way, it's sinful, but if it's used in this way, it can actually be God honoring and helpful. And I think one of the, the biggest examples of this is technology. You can look at, at technology and see how it can be used for evil or how it can be used for good and to glorify God and serve him. You know, mobile f devices can be so detrimental and the cause of so much sin and problems, and yet also they can be a device that helps me organize my thoughts to teach God's word to those of you that are here. You think about social media and how that can be such a, a, a problematic area of, of sin and depravity, and yet our staff works to use that and redeem it by presenting content on teaching God's word and, and, and helping people follow Jesus on a daily basis on those platforms. Our, our video technology here is another example. Certainly the cameras and video and live streaming can be used for evil, but with our, our tech team, they're used to bring God's word and, and worship into over a thousand homes and living rooms and cubicles and kitchen tables every single week. And so there's, there's places where we can say, hey, there, there's an option for us to shift how and why we use something for it to be honorable. But really what it comes down to is, is are we living with intentionality and thinking about what we're doing? Because I suspect that some of us have a default tendency in there. You look at the church in Corinth, they had a default receive mentality. They're like, oh, we'll just bring it all in. We'll do everything, everything from our culture, everything from our past life. Hey, we've got freedom, everything's cool. All things are lawful, bring it on. But you can see where that led them into sin, where it created hindrances in their walk with God. We also know of, of some religious uh, communities that have a default reject mentality. That, that are prone to bullying parents for letting their kids read Harry Potter or watch Disney movies, or who say, hey, we have to seclude ourselves from society and reject technology and automobiles so that we can be holy and different. 
but they give up the opportunity to be a witness. So I, I think that, that my conviction isn't that uh, we need to be one or the other, but we need to live with a balance of all three. And we live with intentionality, and the way that we do that is, is by asking ourselves two questions. The first is asking, hey, does God's word specifically speak to this item? Before we ask if we want to do it or if, if people around us want to do it, the first question is, hey, does God's word speak to this because that's our authority? But the second question is to ask, does this help or hurt my relationship with Jesus? Because there's some areas that are, that are gray areas. There's some areas that aren't directly spoken to. There's, there's areas where we have to use judgment and wisdom. And if we prioritize our relationship with Jesus and say, does this help or hurt me in my pursuit of drawing closer to Christ? That puts that as a priority and helps us navigate with wisdom. So my question that I'd love for you to ponder this week is, what are the areas of your life that are hindering your walk with Jesus? Because I suspect we all have something that, that's in our life. Maybe it's a, a lifestyle item. Maybe it's a thought process. Maybe it's a habit that we're holding on to. Maybe it's an area of sin that we're trying to conceal and manage. But what is it that's hindering your walk with Jesus? And why are you allowing that to have power over the most important thing in your life, which is following Christ? Because if, if we want to, to live our life the way God has called us to, we need to have intentionality and prioritize the right things. And Paul's bringing this up to show, hey, to the church in Corinth, there's something in the way of you following Jesus correctly. And, and he gets a little bit more specific than that when he shows us that our decisions on sexuality have a spiritual impact. Let's look again at, at verses 15 through 18. He says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It's fun to preach through books of the Bible straight through because you have to camp out in sections like this. You have to go, okay, what's the implication to us there? Because it's easy to look and go, man, there, some things were really messed up for the church in Corinth. And it makes sense if you look back at history, we see that, well, Corinth was the hometown of the temple of Aphrodite. There, of all places in the ancient world, this was a place prone to sexual perversion and problems. And even though that temple had been destroyed well before this church was established, you can tell that there's still some lingering issues. Because basically what Paul is saying is that he, you guys don't realize that the use of prostitutes is a problem with your pursuit of following Jesus. He's like, this should be obvious to you. It's obvious uh, from the outside looking in, but they were in that place of struggling with this issue. And see, I, I think we're prone to look and go, man, they're way more messed up than we are. But I'm not quite sure that's the case. The context that they were living in had maybe a little clearer picture of this, but here we are 2,000 years later in a different continent, still struggling as a society with this topic. See, we're people who, as a, as a, a, a country, are celebrating, condoning activity that is morally opposed to God. We're, we're a society that, that creates entertainment of TV and movies that contains content that not long ago would have been adult-only content. We're, we're a society who, who sets aside a month of the, the year to say, hey, this is our chance to celebrate uh, our perversion against God's design for marriage and sexuality and gender. We're a people who don't have a, a temple of Aphrodite, but we've created a platform for that same issue. We've, we've taken the internet and created the greatest platform for pornography that has ever existed in the history of the world. See, I, I was looking at some statistics on this. 25% of all web searches that exist are aimed at pornography that, that drive to one of over 45 million adult content websites that are existing out there. I, I found a, a study that... Um, that Porn websites receive more traffic than Netflix, Hulu, and Twitter combined every single month. The, the revenue that's generated from adult content surpasses the revenue that exists in all major sports leagues combined. 
The a most recent survey that I could find showed that in the last year, over 65% of men and nearly 40% of women had consumed this content in the last year. This isn't an old issue. This is an issue that is still existing in our day today. And it's so pervasive, and yet we wonder why deviancy and sin seem to be increasing in the world around us. And so Paul's words here aren't just for a church on a different continent 2,000 years ago. They're words for us as well, to live as people focused on Christ and focused on the life he has for us. And so as Paul explains to them how they were out of bounds and was trying to get them back into some semblance of moral uh, living, he gives them a couple of things. He first gives them a proper context for their sexuality and then also helps them see what happens when they step out of it. And so the proper context he gets to, he, he quotes Jesus uh, in verse 19 where he says, you know, you've heard it written, the two will become one flesh. And he references a quote of Jesus as Jesus gives an explanation for marriage and sexuality and he assumes that they would know this full context. So for us, let's make sure we know this full context. In Matthew 19, Jesus says this. He says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. There are some radically countercultural truths presented in that right there. But Paul's saying this is the context for sexuality. The context is marriage. And marriage is properly and biblically defined as one man and one woman for one lifetime. And any adjustment or modification to that plan is outside of God's design for us. And yet there's so many ways that our culture is, is seeking to reorder when that happens, to change who it happens with, to change all these different aspects of it. And every time we do that, we step into sin. And Paul gives some urgency of this obedience. He says, hey guys, this is the way it's to happen. And he says in verse 19 that we're to flee from sexual immorality. It's not that we try and manage it or, or, or control it. He says, run from it. And I think that there's too many uh, Christians in our world today that are trying to manage this area of their life while also seeking to follow Jesus and wondering why it's not going the way they want it to. But he's, he says, we need to flee from this which means practically that, that we need to prioritize our obedience to Christ in this area of our life because there's implications if we don't. See, it's not that, that God's a prude or doesn't want us to enjoy this way. No, he actually is the one who created this activity, this way that we can enjoy pleasure with our spouse. But when we step outside of the context that he created it for, Paul shows us that it affects our relationship with Jesus. It, there's a spiritual implication that, that now we're sinning and, and, and we're creating a distance between us and our very Savior. And we'll go on more detail to that in a minute. But it affects our spiritual walk. It affects our, our relationships. 60% of all divorces indicate infidelity as a cause of their divorce. The sexual sin and problems create a, an erosion of the very relationships we hope to have succeed. Furthermore, I found uh, one, uh, actually multiple secular, non-Christian studies that showed that premarital sex had a direct correlation to a divorce likelihood, kind of forever putting to debt the, hey, you're gonna get married anyways, it's okay argument. Even more so, it affects our mental health. See, our, 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 our nation's trying to navigate, how, how do we understand mental health? How do we get better in that way? And yet we're pursuing lifestyle decisions that are eroding that. I read a study that from 2021 uh, on a college campus that found a direct correlation to frequency of pornography use and intensity of depression and anxiety rates among those who they surveyed. It's eroding every aspect of our life, which is why Paul says that we need to flee from it. We need to run from this area of sin in our life. So hear the urgency and respond accordingly, because if we think that just a little lust is fine if we don't act on it is okay, then we're heading for destruction in our spiritual and relational lives. If we think that the regular viewing of explicit content is okay because we're consenting adults to understand that it's destroying our lives. If we think that, that 
that embracing some of these cultural items is okay because culture has moved. We're distorting the truth and we're seeking to undermine the very life that God has for us. And see, we, we look at these items and we're, we're processing what Paul's saying here about our sexuality, about how we navigate culture, but he ends with the greatest why that exists. He ends with this why because the purpose of our life is to live for God and honor him. How we navigate culture, how we handle our sexuality matters, not because of, what, it, not because of a, a reason of, well, the Bible says so or a preacher on a stage said so, but because of the purpose of our life. So look back with me at verse 19 and 20. It says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. If you're looking for a reason why to listen to this teaching or why to, to heed the urgency of obedience here, he says, I'm gonna give it to you. It's because the Holy Spirit lives within you because you were bought with a price because your purpose is to live for God and honor him. See, there's some, some important things that we need to catch in those two short verses. And the first is that when we step into a relationship with Jesus, we become a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. And to the people that were hearing this probably had even more significance because they would have understood and remembered the, the Jewish temple and how it functioned. But in the, from the Old Testament, what was established is that within the Jewish temple, there was this, this cube within the center called the Holy of Holies. And that's where they could go to experience the presence of God. But it wasn't just anyone that would go there. It was the priest alone one time a year after he had gone through a, a, a pretty extensive process of, of repentance and ceremonial cleansing, he would go in there for a short period and then withdraw. Because he understood that if, if there was not that ceremonial cleansing, not that repentance, you can't mix unholiness with holiness. But Jesus' death on the cross changed all that. See, scripture outlines that when Jesus died on the cross, that there was this earthquake, and one of the things that happened was that the temple was affected. The, the curtain, the veil that, can, that separated the Holy of Holies from everything else was torn in two from top to bottom, showing that that wasn't the only place to experience the presence of God anymore. And we keep reading, we get to the book of Acts, as the early church is established, we see that God pours out his Holy Spirit on all the believers in that day, and, and the same carries true for us today. That when we profess Jesus as our Savior, when we believe that he is the Son of God and Savior of the world, that he died on a cross for our sins, and we say, hey, I want to live for you, he dwells within us to teach us, to guide us, to help us, to rebuke and correct us, to explain and help us understand what it means to follow God. But Paul connects these two things. He says, if your body is a dwelling place of God, but if, if this area of sin is sinning against your body, you're bringing sin into a place where God's residing. He says, you can't mix holiness and unholiness. And yet, when we live in this area of sin, that's what we're doing. But even more so, we understand that this is possible because we were bought with a price. He says, remember, you were bought with a price. And the, and the background of this statement is that when we live in sin and rebellion, we separate ourselves from God, but we also rack up this debt of sin where, where we owe a, a penalty, we owe punishment because of what we've done against a holy and righteous God. But because he loves us, he sent his son Jesus to restore the relationship, but also to pay the debt that we owed. See, he's holy and righteous. He understands that, hey, there's a debt that's owed. We can't just write it off like we're trying to do with student loans right now. Someone has to pay for it. And that someone is Jesus. Instead of us, that wrath and punishment is put on the perfect son of God and savior of the world on our behalf so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be made right, so that our debt could be repaid and we could have a clean slate and a fresh start. There's this extravagant and generous act of love from our Heavenly Father. And there's this the idea of why would we continue sinning to abuse this grace that we've received? In, in Romans 6, Paul clearly spells that out. He's like, no, you wouldn't keep sinning. You're not going to abuse the grace that you've received. Instead, you're going to live for God with your life. Because the response to the fact that, that the Holy Spirit is in us and we've been bought with this price of the Son of God is that we live for him. That we say, hey, the purpose of our life 
is to live for God, to worship him, and to, to orient everything we have on him. See, Paul in Romans 12, just a few pages back, says this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, we're told to, to use our lives as an act of worship, not as something where we're, we're dabbling in sin and trying to also pursue Jesus but instead to fully devote our life to glorifying God and honoring him with everything we do because God's living within us and because we've been bought with a price, the, the most glorious price of Jesus giving his life for us. See, we've got so much that we have to navigate as followers of Jesus. We have freedom in Christ, but we have to use that freedom to walk in holiness and walk in intentionality and wisdom. And I hope that the, the direction of your navigation is, is forever fixated on glorifying and honoring God with your life. Because as it shows here, God loves us so much that he bought us with a price. So let's return that with worship, with focusing our lives on glorifying and honoring him with our actions, with our decisions, with our bodies, with everything that we have. Because he is worthy of that worship. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for sections of scripture that challenge and convict us about how we navigate the life around us. God, I thank you for the fact that you loved us and sent your son Jesus to save us. As people who are unworthy, as people who continually sin against you, God, we thank you for your grace. Grace that is greater than our sin, grace that makes it possible for us to find right relationship with you. And today we pray that you would help us to step into obedience in every area of our life, to see what exists in our life that is hindering our walk with you. Whether it's places of blatant sin and rebellion against you or places of complacency and laziness of following you in obedience, God, we want to strip all of that away so that we can honor you and glorify you with our life. Because God, you have been so generous to us. You've been so gracious to save us even while we were still sinning against you. So God, help us to live with intentionality, and to focus all of our purpose on glorifying and honoring you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you process what Pastor Robert just shared, let me encourage you to think about what steps you can take this week to better live for God. And pray for the strength to fight temptation to live for your own desires. If today's message spoke to you and you would like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website at calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, you can listen to past sermons, and you can subscribe to our Word for the Day daily devotionals. Well, that's all for now. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.